Welcome to the best of the day. I am Ramaswamy Govindan, Medical Oncology Co-Director at Washington University School of Medicine in St. Louis, Missouri. We are in Madrid for the European Society of Medical Oncology meeting. Today we'll be talking about GU malignancies, particularly prostate cancer. I have a distinguished uh, expert here, Dr. Cora Sternberg. She is the Chairman of Medical Oncology at San Camillo Forlanini Hospital in Roma, Italia. I hope I didn't butcher the name of the hospital. Dr. It was Sternberg. very nice. It was very nice the way you said it. Thank you. Dr. Sternberg, before we get started, I have to tell you this. Several years ago, I was at the ASCO meeting, sitting on the front row, and you were debating Dr. Dean Bajoran on a wonderful presentation, and your presentation was so good. I remember Larry Einhorn saying, note to self, don't ever debate Cora Sternberg. And I learned, I've learned that lesson very well, so I'm not going to debate you. I'm going to ask you a few questions. Yeah, we'll just have a conversation. Absolutely. And uh, so you've been at this meeting. So tell us a little bit about what are the key abstracts that caught your attention, presentations that you really think are going to be important for the practice of oncology? Well, I think that there are a few. Um, two in particular in terms of prostate cancer that I think are very important. One, by, actually by the Eastern Cooperative Group, uh, in collaboration with the SWAG was presented by C Chris Sweeney. This has also been presented in part b at mm -hmm. uh, the ASCO meeting at the plenary session. This is called the charted study and this the theory is that with patients with uh, hormone sensitive metastatic prostate cancer are usually treated with androgen deprivation therapy. The theory behind their trial is that these patients may harbor cells or clones of cells mm -hmm. that will be resistant to hormonal therapy or that by giving them hormonal therapy we will allow just the resistant cells to grow out. And the thought is also that if we wait too long to give chemotherapy that perhaps the patients will be too sick to get chemotherapy later on. So they wanted to test the hypothesis of giving early chemotherapy with docetaxel chemotherapy plus androgen deprivation mm -hmm. therapy as compared to androgen deprivation therapy alone. And they did a study of more than 700 patients and what they found was a 14 month improvement in overall survival in the combined mm -hmm. therapy arm. This um, improvement is particularly notable for the patients that they have defined as being at high risk. Mm -hmm. Their definition of high risk, which is not really universally accepted, I must say, mm -hmm. is patients who have at least four bony metastases and one of them has to be outside of the axillary or, axillar or mm -hmm. skeleton or pelvis or visceral disease. And this, their patients with this high risk goes along with the other studies that they presented in the past by Maha Hussein mm -hmm. with the SWOG showing a, a poorer survival than patients with lower risk. And those patients, the study was designed for patients with this high risk, but then they put also patients with low risk in it. Mm -hmm. In the high risk patients, there was a 17 month improvement in overall survival mm -hmm. by giving six cycles of docetaxel chemotherapy up front with the hormonal therapy. So I feel that this is potentially practice changing, mm -hmm. and particularly with our a younger patient who has high risk disease, when you see this patient with metastatic disease, I think you really today need to discuss the pros and cons of giving upfront chemotherapy with the hormonal therapy. This is actually fascinating because in lung cancer we deal with a similar situation. So you have drug A that produces X number of months, drug B produces you know, Y number of months. When you combine them, you have a maybe a little bit more advantage. So I often ask myself, is it better to do sequentially so you get the maximum for everything mm -hmm. or you do in a combined fashion? Um, when you do this combination therapy, the toxicities are higher. And what happens after they progress? Are there good options? And um, uh, does this approach change the way we sequence drugs beyond not giving docetaxel, of course? Well. First of all, docetaxel was approved in 2004, and it was approved for patients um, with castration-resistant prostate cancer. And until 2004, medical oncologists were not really even involved so mm -hmm. much with prostate cancer. I used to be able to name on one hand all the genitourinary oncologists in the world who were involved in this. But since then, the, there was something that the genitourinary oncologists could do. Until then, the urologist kept the patients, they gave them hormonal therapies, and then when they were ready for palliative care or dying, they would 
send them off or mm -hmm. maybe send them to the medical oncologist. So having docetaxel chemotherapy in 2004 for patients who were resistant to castration was really a big deal because it, it, it began, the medical oncologist began to speak to the urologist and we began to have more multidisciplinary care. Mm -hmm. By having more disciplinary team care, trusting each other more, we've now developed and done studies and have five new drugs for patients with castration-resistant prostate mm -hmm. cancer. Five new drugs which improve survival and also improve quality of life. So things have really changed. They've really mm -hmm. changed. So this is interesting. So you think it is now becoming a common practice uh, to combine chemotherapy with uh, uh, hormonal agents in uh, hormone sensitive? Uh, no, the, this is brand new. It was first presented at the ASCO plenary session mm -hmm. in June, and more data were presented, particularly, particularly in the high risk patients today at the ESMO meeting. I don't think it is common practice yet. It's certainly not common practice yet in Europe, but I think it will become more common practice um, as people look at these data. And it, I think it needs to be discussed with our patients, particularly the younger patients. Perhaps if you have an 80-year-old patient, you might right. consider not doing this. But for our younger patients, our fit patients, I think we, it's our obligation to do this. Since this is so brand new, for the, what advice do you have for our practicing oncologists about this? Because after all, prostate cancer is very common. Well, the practicing oncologists should discuss with their patients this particular study, that if they have patients that are high risk and have a lot of disease or visceral disease, they should not just start them on hormonal therapy, that they could potentially have a 17-month advantage mm -hmm. by giving them chemotherapy. Docetaxel chemotherapy is always given with prednisone twice a day, but in this study, they didn't give the prednisone. The patients tolerated the chemotherapy very well, maybe mm -hmm. because they weren't patients that had been on hormonal therapy for many years. They were maybe they were in better shape, and the, there was not a lot of problem with toxicity with the chemotherapy. Mm -hmm. And it was really only six cycles, every mm -hmm. one every three weeks. It wasn't such a big deal in yeah. terms of the chemotherapy. This is fascinating. Uh, Dr. Sternberg is absolutely awesome. So what are the papers that caught your attention in prostate cancer you want to talk well, about? Well, that, that's for hormone sensitive. In terms of the uh, castration-resistant disease, as I, as I told you, docetaxel was always our starting point. So when we registered new drugs, we registered them in a kind of a, a registration space of post-docetaxel or pre-docetaxel. And this is an artificial space which will be changing now because we have all these new drugs that are moving earlier up front and they'll be used before docetaxel. So one of these new drugs is called um, abiraterone acetate. And what, you need, what I need to also say is that we have understood lately more about the biology of the disease that patients who seem to have castration, to be castrated, to have castration levels of testosterone, still produce endogenous testosterone. They produce it in the adrenal glands, the prostate cancer tumor cells itself produce testosterone, and the testis also produces testosterone. So abiraterone acetate blocks an enzyme called CYP17, blocking the production of testosterone in these three places. And so even though a patient has less than 50 nanograms of uh, um, testosterone level and they seem to be castrated, they can have a further response by using um, abiraterone acetate. So this was a study uh, called the Cougar 302 study, and it was over 1,000 patients. They were randomized one-to-one, -one, patients with metastatic castration-resistant prostate cancer. They were patients who were asymptomatic or just minimally symptomatic, and they were randomized one-to-one -to, -one to receive either abiraterone acetate and prednisone or placebo and prednisone. Now, at the first interim analysis of this study, the IDMC stopped the study because there was a 57% reduction in the risk of progression. And they stopped the study. They said it's unethical. We can't continue it anymore. And then all the patients were then crossed over to abiraterone. And when this was first presented at ASCO a few years ago, the biostatistician was very upset because she said, you know, we're not meet, meeting our boundary, the O'Brien Fleming boundary for overall survival by stopping the study early. So what's happened was the survival had a, a, a trend in overall survival, but there was not an overall survival advantage. Mm -hmm. Having said that, um, they've done a second, a third, and this was the fourth 
analysis mm -hmm. and the last plan in analysis that was presented today with a 49 months, like a four year follow up, and now the overall survival has also become positive. This is important for regulatory agencies as well who didn't mm -hmm. necessarily want to approve this drug um, before chemotherapy. Uh, I think that be, uh, for reimbursement purposes as well. But I think the fact that um, this drug given before chemotherapy uh, shows an overall survival advantage is very important. So these are oral drugs. They're well tolerated by the patient. And you have to realize that in both arms of the, the study, patients then go on to have all of these other therapies that I mentioned. They then go on to have docetaxel. We have enzalutamide. We had cabacitaxel. We had a study with cabozantinib. So they got many other treatments mm -hmm. along the way. So having a positive study for overall survival um, with a drug that's not toxic a long time until they needed chemotherapy is, is a very, it's very positive. And I think it's practice changing. And I know in the United States that many physicians are giving uh, abiraterone uh, acetate up front rather than giving chemotherapy. Because patients would rather have an oral drug than right. chemotherapy. And at least you can delay the, you know, re receiving chemotherapy. And delay the time to chemotherapy. Although they may get it now in the front line with hormone sensitive only the the, That's only for a High small volume. portion of patients who are that's very high volume. That's important point, absolutely. Yeah. And the other ones I was just talking about have castration resistant disease, and they were asymptomatic or minimally symptomatic, the ones in this study called the mm -hmm. Cougar 302. Yeah, absolutely, fascinating developments. Any biomarkers coming up to select patients who benefit you know, the most from that's these so, things? That's so important. The problem is that we have done these studies, each study having about 1,000 patients, and we've given all the drugs to all the people without really selecting patients mm -hmm based on biomarkers. When we look now retrospectively at the trials, I can tell you that um, we thought that with chemotherapy, it seemed that the, Gleason, the higher Gleason score patients are the ones who respond to chemotherapy and that the hormonal patients uh, and the lower Gleason score um, wouldn't, wouldn't respond as much. But we find now that if we look back on the AFFIRM trial, which is a, a trial of enzalutamide, no matter if the Gleason score was less than eight or higher than eight, patients have advantages in terms of uh, mm -hmm. radiologic progression-free survival. If we look at the PREVAIL trial, which is enzalutamide before, they, no matter if the Gleason score is less than eight or higher than eight, they have advantages. Mm -hmm. The same with the, um, the two Cougar trials, patients have advantages no matter if the Gleason score is higher or lower than eight. The same with PSA, PSA doesn't seem to matter. If the median PSA was high or low, patients have advantage with with, with, with these new drugs. We found uh, along the way that, uh, in one study at least, uh, looking at um, ultra-sensitive assays for testosterone, that the patients who still have high testosterone levels are the ones who have a better prognosis overall. Mm -hmm. um, other biomarkers have not really been uh, validated or, or useful to help us select patients. And, but we have, do have the story of the splice, the splice variants, mm -hmm. which is perhaps, I think, the most exciting. There's uh, recent work uh, published by John Hopkins University. Um, these results show that uh, we know that splice variants are, are common, and they are um, the, when the androgen receptor uh, loses its uh, ligand binding mm -hmm. domain at the C-terminal, they can be constituent, the androgen receptor can be constitutively active on its own. And uh, there are at least 20 splice variants have been mm -hmm. described, but the ARV7 is perhaps the most common splice variant. And what they did at John Hopkins was they measured, they took blood, so mm -hmm. in circulating tumor cells without doing any biopsies, they took blood and they measured this splice variant. And what they found that both with enzalutamide and with abiraterone, that if patients harbored this splice variant, they're there, they had a 0% of PSA response with enzalutamide, mm. a 0% PSA response with uh, abiraterone. Mm. And if you looked at their um, clinical and radiological progression-free survival, the um, patients with enzalutamide had an uh, eight-fold better chance of not having um, uh, progression if they didn't have the splice mm. variant. And it, with abiraterone, it was 16 a 16 fold mm. better chance of not progressing if they didn't have the splice variant. They also showed that some patients didn't have the splice variant and then they became resistant and developed the splice variant and they didn't, they didn't mm -hmm. respond as well to therapy. So I think this, this can be validated and repeated. The study was just published in the New England Journal of Medicine, only 62 patients, mm. but I think it's very promising. 
And this assay is not commercially available it's yet. It's not commercially available. No, but it seems very promising. It seems very promising. I think it's the most exciting work that I've right. heard so far. Right. Because all of the other clinical markers that we've looked at have not really been very helpful. Mm -hmm. no, these, are, these are all great developments. And I think as we know more and more about the molecular biology using the exome transcriptome analysis, I'm sure we'll be able to figure out many right. of these things uh, routinely. What's even more fascinating is that we'll be able to do this in peripheral blood. You know, that's absolutely exactly. uh, wonderful. I know we are running out of time, but um, do you want to say a few words about uh, our renal cell cancer um, before we close? I think there's been a lot of developments and a lot of excitement in renal cancer. I've been involved with developing a number of the um, tyrosine kinase inhibitors in renal cancer and involved with a, a lot of the studies also with the mTOR inhibitors mm -hmm. in renal cancer, both of which are, are very active in first line and in second line and in patients with poor risk renal cancer. But we now have the new um, anti-PD-1 ligands, mm -hmm. um, which are, seem to be very active in lung cancer, mm -hmm. in bladder cancer, in renal cancer as well. And we're beginning studies now with combining uh, anti-PD-1 uh, ligand with, with ipilimumab also mm -hmm. in renal cancer. And I think that it's, it could be very promising, that these, yeah. these new drugs. You know, bladder cancer in many ways reminds me of lung cancer. You know, they have some, Absolutely. you know, they're related Absolutely. to tobacco smoking and there are a lot of mutational burden and things like that. They respond that. to the same Absolutely. drugs often, yeah, the same old chemotherapy the drugs and they respond yeah, to the from same drugs. Yeah, from carboplatin onwards, yeah, so it's they fascinating. Do. I wish we had more time to talk about all these things. And uh, um, so really this has been, uh, this field is moving very fast, very yes. very far forward compared to the days when I was a fellow treating prostate cancer several years ago. Dr. Sternberg, I really want to thank you for your excellent uh, summary of uh, today's events particularly, and what's happening in the field of GU malignancies, particularly prostate cancer. I want to thank you, the audience, for listening to our presentation today. And uh, I'm sure you'll be looking at these presentations that are coming out of the ESMO meeting in the coming days. Uh, uh, please do feel free to contact us with any questions or any comments that you have to improve our program. Thank you very much. <laughs>